in 2001, at least here in Oregon, we had this huge push, and I think it happened nationwide for pediatricians, to move the hepatitis B vaccine from teenagers to newborns. And I remember when they made that push, I'm going, this makes no sense. So you catch hepatitis B from sex and IV drug use. Babies don't do that. Well, you could catch it from the mother. That's true. That's the only way a baby can get hepatitis B is if their mother has hepatitis B. And um, the babies in my practice, to this day, I haven't had a single mom with hepatitis B. That's how rare it is. You go to the CDC website and they say it's, oh, one in a hundred moms have hepatitis B. But even that, I think it's less than that depending where you work, I suppose. But even that, we're injecting a huge toxic dose of aluminum to a newborn on day one of life for a vaccine they don't need. And you might ask, well, how did they talk you into doing that, right? Because I remember walking down the halls of the hospital talking to a couple of fellow pediatricians going, can you believe this? We're supposed to give the hepatitis B to newborns? And, so, and they said, well, you know, they're saying we might develop a population immune to hepatitis B and we can eradicate it. Sounded good. The herd immunity concept. Yeah, yeah. And I couldn't argue with it. It hadn't been tried. So I'm a pro-vaccine pediatrician. You know, vaccines is the best thing we can do to, to, you know, protect children. And so we did it. You know, in 2002 in our office, we, we made this huge shift and we started not only were we giving all the newborns their first hep B in the hospital at two months, you get your second dose, and at six months, your third dose, on top of the, the already fairly busy schedule. And we were catching up the other kids. So my own kids were in that sort of, a couple of them were in that catch-up phase. You know, you, they were past the infant stage, but they weren't teenagers. So a lot of hepatitis B vaccine being done at that point. And that was the same time we took thimerosal out of the vaccines. And I just... I think about that because, you know, when people talk about the autism rates that have continued to go up, some of the studies have said, well, there was no change in the autism rate when we stopped thimerosal, so therefore it wasn't the thimerosal. Yeah, but we added the hepatitis B, a huge, huge increased dose of that neurotoxin right at the same time. Aluminum. Aluminum. Again, we have a vaccine that contains massive doses of aluminum, which is a known neurotoxin. In this next segment, Dr. Paul Thomas, who's a board-certified pediatrician, runs through the calculation of exactly how much aluminum a newborn baby is getting in the hepatitis B vaccine. It is vital that we start looking at the aluminum content of vaccines the same way we did for mercury, thimerosal, because we are far exceeding the safe doses. Just use the newborn hepatitis B dose as an example. It has 250 micrograms of aluminum. And remember, we're not supposed to exceed five micrograms per kilogram. Well, what does a baby weigh? At the most, five kilos. I mean, that's an 11 pound baby, practically. So five times five, five kilo baby, don't exceed five micrograms per kilogram. 25 micrograms of aluminum is what is supposedly the safe limit. With any toxin we've learned, like we did with lead, there's no safe dose, right? But even if you go with that dose, we know if you exceed that, it's not safe and we're injecting 250 micrograms, 10 times the possibly safe dose, known toxin injected into every baby born in America. This is what bugged me since 2001. When, when they moved that hep B to newborns and nobody cared, nobody made a fuss, nobody looked into it. It was like, all right, we got a problem. And it's just the magnitude of the problem is just growing. The hepatitis B vaccine has a very, very long list of neurological complications from blindness to uh, Guillain-Barre to all kinds of, of, of a very long list of neurological complications. And there really isn't any reason to even give that vaccine at birth. Doctors in America do not give their children the hepatitis B vaccine at birth because they know it's not safe and they know it's not necessary. And even though they recommend it for their patients, they don't do it for their own family. But I didn't know why a tiny newborn born to hepatitis B negative parents would need to have a hepatitis B vaccine. And then something really un unbelievable happened. Um, Two weeks later, when we went back to the pediatrician, the pediatrician, very I was so worried that I had said no to this vaccine because I wanted to do what the doctors told me. I knew that they had our best interests in mind. And 
we, my husband and I were these nervous Nelly new parents and, you know, and we said, gosh, we didn't do that, you know, because we, we were both hepatitis B negative and we didn't think it was a necessary vaccine. And the doctor completely casually, she says, oh, it's a good thing you didn't do that. That vaccine has been counterindicated in newborns. And my husband and I looked at each other with white faces, like, you know, the blood just drained from my face because we thought, what if we had said yes to this vaccine and now she's telling me it's been counterindicated? So this was a very strange thing. And it took me 10 years to figure out what had actually happened, <laughs> um, which is that in 1999, the CDC realized that they had never counted up the cumulative exposure to mercury that was being given in the infant vaccine schedule. So it just so happened, my daughter was born in July of 1999. It just so happened that it was at that moment that they had issued, um, a, you know, a statement had gone out to every pediatrician in the country saying, in the, you know, in the, in the interest of caution, let's not do the hepatitis B at birth because of the worry about mercury exposure. So it wasn't technically true that it had been counterindicated. And as you know, we still give the hepatitis B vaccine um, to newborns. It's still a completely problematic and probably completely unnecessary vaccine. Um, but at that time, it was the best thing that could have ever happened to us because it made me realize that we needed to really do the research for ourselves. Well, I remember in 1991 when the CDC said every newborn baby in the newborn nursery must get a hepatitis B shot before leaving that nursery. Hepatitis B vaccine was a vaccine for a disease that had a very low incidence in the United States. Hepatitis B has been endemic in certain parts of Asia and Africa, but has never been a problem in the United States, Europe, or Canada. However, they said, oh, Got to give all these babies the hepatitis B shot at birth, even though the high-risk groups are adult groups, IV drug users being the leading group. 80% of IV drug users have hepatitis B. But there was almost, in 1991, less than one half of 1% of mothers had hepatitis B who could possibly give their newborns hepatitis B. And when that policy came out, I remembered going to a meeting in the 1980s at the CDC. I was there with a mother reporting the death of her son from DPT vaccine. And as we waited to talk, there was a presentation on hepatitis B vaccine by a manufacturer who said, look, if you can't get the high risk groups in this country, the IV drug users, people with multiple sexual partners, to use this vaccine, you're going to just have to pass laws to shoot it into the arms of every high school kid in this country because we're not going to have an orphan drug on our hands. And instead of shooting it into every high school kid, although they're doing that too, they decided to get the babies. The little babies at 12 hours of age in the newborn nursery when you have absolutely no idea the immune status of that child the neurological status of that child. When that baby has just emerged from the womb and you are going to stick a hepatitis B shot in that child, when the mother, most mothers, 99.99% .99 of mothers are not hepatitis B positive and there's no risk to that baby for hepatitis B. And then you, you know that the hepatitis B antibodies wear off. And when the child becomes a teenager and may become a drug user or sexually active or multiple partners, may not be protected. This was a policy that was absolutely had no science behind it. Early in my practice, I did do some vaccinations, but I didn't do them under six months of age because I knew the main window of SIDS was six months of age and under. And I would offer them as elective, an elective procedure to people, like you can choose this or not choose it. We would do one at a time, spread them out, do the ones parents wanted, not the ones that they didn't want. And that was my approach to it because I always viewed it as an elective procedure. I mean, subsequently, as it came around, when they introduced the hepatitis B vaccine for one day old infants and then the chickenpox vaccine, I just, said to myself, I'm never going to give those vaccines as a routine, and I don't really agree with the whole vaccination schedule as it, as it is. So I just, at a certain point, decided to stop vaccinating in my practice. They Del Bigtree just mentioned that the hepatitis B vaccine was tested for four days before it was put on the market. Merck stated in their 1993 product insert that, and I quote, 
In a group of studies, 1,636 doses of the hepatitis B vaccine were administered to 653 healthy infants and children up to 10 years of age who were monitored for five days after each dose. Dell also just mentioned that the USA has more infant deaths than any other country. A study by Neil Miller and Dr. Gary Goldman supports this assertion. Here's Neil Miller discussing that study. He and I worked on a study together and we looked at the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, which is a uh, jointly owned database, jointly owned by the CDC and the FDA. It's a federal database where people, doctors and parents can report adverse reactions to vaccines. If they get a vaccine and they think that the vaccine caused a problem, they can, they can report it. And we, as independent researchers, were able to download the entire vaccine adverse event reporting system. We were able to extract out of that all the infants that had reports. We had 38,000 reports of infants okay. that had adverse reactions to vaccines. And then we looked at, we, uh, Dr. Gary Goldman is a computer scientist as well and created a program that was able to stratify these babies, these infants, by the number of doses that they received. So we had 38,000 infants that had adverse re reactions reported to the vaccine adverse reporting uh, event reporting system. And then we were able to stratify them by, stratify the, these, these infants by, did, did they receive two doses? of vaccines, three doses, four doses, five doses, six doses, seven doses, or eight doses before they had their adverse reaction. And then we, were, we only were interested in looking at, did these children end up with a serious adverse reaction? We weren't interested in babies that just had a, a mild reaction. Maybe they had a little pain at the injection site, or maybe they had a fever after they received the vaccine. We only wanted to look at were these babies hospitalized? Was their adverse event serious enough that it required them to be hospitalized? Okay. And or did they die after receiving that okay. vaccine? And what we found was that babies that received eight vaccines were statistically significantly more likely to be hospitalized or die than babies that received seven, six, five, four, three, or two vaccines at the same time. Okay. Babies that received seven vaccines at the same time were statistically significantly more likely to be hospitalized or die than babies that received six, five, four, three, or two vaccines at the same time. So what we documented was that the more vaccines that a baby receives simultaneously, the more dangerous it is. Mm. The more likely that baby is to be hospitalized or die. Early in my career, I saw three babies die of SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome, within 24 hours of being vaccinated. Uh, it wasn't like everybody who was getting vaccinated had SIDS, but every SIDS case that I ever encountered had the baby had just been vaccinated within the last 24 hours, and I just I knew in my heart that something was wrong. Is it possible that some SIDS deaths are actually a vaccine injury that's misclassified? So I think it's absolutely possible. I. As a pediatrician, I was trained that, you know, vaccines are safe and effective and, and of course they have nothing to do with SIDS. SIDS is sudden infant death syndrome. Whenever you hear syndrome at the end of something, it means we don't know, right? These kids just died. And um, I, in fact, I just saw an article this morning, I, I was looking over some things and I think it was from 2007, but there was somewhere overseas, there were twins who died within hours of getting their vaccine, like within the next day, both of them. And, and it's like, boy, when you read that, and it, was, it was presented as a case report of, you know, you can have, uh, I forget how they named the study, but twins who die of SIDS, right? So this unknown death of unknown cause, hmm, they incidentally both got vaccinated the day before. To me, that's not a coincidence. The CDC's official position is that SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome is not caused by vaccines and that there's no connection. Any relationship is purely coincidental. Perhaps due to the fact that the peak age for SIDS is two to four months, which coincides with the introduction of 11 shots containing 16 vaccines within the U.S. vaccination schedule, this has led to the CDC's official statement on SIDS found at cdc.gov. Here's a statement and I quote, babies receive many vaccines when they are between two to four months old. This age range is also the peak age for sudden infant death syndrome, SIDS, 
or infant death that cannot be explained. The timing of the two month and the four month shots and SIDS has led some people to question whether they might be related. However, studies have found that vaccines do not cause and are not linked to SIDS, end quote. However, in 2011, there was a study published in Statistics and Medicine that reviewed 300 unexplained deaths. And here's what they found. They found a 16-fold increase of death after the fourth dose of a quadrivalent vaccine, that's with four different viruses. And they could detect that with at least 90% accuracy. They also found a general two-fold increase after only one vaccination, detected with a power of 80%. So there is a study, and I'm actually going to quote from that study, but it was in the uh, Journal of uh, Medicine and Chemistry, and it was this year. It was in 2017, actually. And uh, a 2017 uh, study published on current medicine and chemistry concluded that there exists a need that deaths occurring in a short space of time, in other words, shortly after, a hexavalent vaccination are appropriately investigated and submitted to a post-mortem, which basically is an autopsy, uh, examination, particularly of the autonomic nervous system, okay, a specific part of your nervous system, uh, by an expert pathologist, so we're talking about taking tissue and looking at it under a microscope, to objectively evaluate possible, the possible causative role of a vaccine in SIDS. And so I don't know that that it's, it's definitive, it certainly doesn't sound like it's definitive, but this study concluded that, in other words, if I hit you in the toe with a hammer and you have pain one second later, I wonder what caused your toe pain? Probably the hammer. So if I give you an injection and shortly after that you become extremely ill and die, I think there probably needs to be an investigation as to why that child died. Uh, you know, children usually, I mean, you know, SIDS is a, is a, is a enigma, you know, and there's probably lots of causes of it, but there obviously have been cases where a child received a hexavalent vaccination and died in a very short period of time from the time the vaccination was given. And that's what that study concluded. So does, do vaccines cause SIDS? I don't know, but it looks that is that looks to be possible. It walks like a duck, it talks like a duck. I hit you in the toe with a hammer, it hurt right the second after I hit you. It probably wasn't something you did yesterday. It's probably the hammer that I just hit you with. You get hit with a vaccine, you die, it probably needs to be looked at. We definitely need to investigate this further. I know that there are many parents who are currently serving prison sentences for killing their baby by shaking them to death. This is called shaken baby syndrome. Doesn't it seem weird that all of a sudden, after all this time, thousands of people are deciding to kill their babies by shaking them to death? Doesn't that seem odd? Doesn't that seem unreasonable? The more I researched it, then I realized that it was a cover-up for vaccine injury. And that's really what you find when you research this topic, shaken baby syndrome. When a good doctor takes a good history on someone, they find out when their condition started. And we want to find out what the issues were at that time. And oftentimes when I take that history on people, we do see that there was a vaccine that just preceded the onset of their symptoms. So I look back and if someone has a thyroid condition that started a couple weeks, a couple months after a round of vaccines or even something just like the flu shot, they start developing symptoms. We have to think that there's some correlation between that vaccination and the onset of thyroid disease. According to Dr. Jack Wolfson, doctors should try to determine when a condition started and then once that happens, they can determine whether or not it was vaccine related. I know that this has happened several times in the, in the course over the last few years, that parents have actually been exonerated and released from prison after the autopsy showed that they could not possibly have, have injured their baby, but that there must have been another cause of death. Are you enjoying episode five thus far? Are you learning a lot of great and valuable information? Do you want to join our movement and support our mission to educate the world on the truth about vaccines? Then please consider supporting our mission by owning the complete series today. Your support allows us to continue to spread the truth for free. Plus, a portion of each and every sale is donated to charities that are doing real research to help our kids be healthier and safer.